back to the show. Today I have retired pastor Howard Storm joining us in the studio. Howard had come on my show before to discuss his near-death experience. He was clinically dead for about 30 minutes. And at that time, he went to heaven and he went through hell and he had a talk with Jesus. So it's my pleasure to welcome him back today to share with the audience what he learned during this experience. Welcome back, Pastor. Thank you. Good to be with you, Gita. All right. All right. Well, the pleasure is all mine. This is super exciting. Um, it's always exciting to talk to you, to have you on the show every time we learn new things. So yeah. Well, so what's been going on? How has life been treating you? <laughs> um, life is good. I, um, I, I turned 76 years old uh, a couple of years ago. I felt like I wasn't um, up to pastoring churches anymore, so I retired, but I'm still very involved with mission work, and I'm very involved with the church that I'm a member of, so um, I keep busy. <laughs> that's great. That's great. I'm sure. I'm sure you're living a fulfilling life. God is great. Yeah. So as you know, we are living in a fallen world, and many are coming um, for answers. They're seeking, and they're not finding because they're not seeking in the right places, so Back then, you were an atheist before yes. this experience. So why don't you share a little bit about that kind of and what led you up to meeting the Lord? And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the changes after that and what Jesus told you. Okay. Um, looking back on what happened to me, um, my parents took us to church most of the time when I say took us, um, they dropped us, me and my two sisters off, but they didn't go. Um, but the thing that, the main reason that led me to atheism, although I was a very enthusiastic uh, young Christian, was the huge disconnect between what we learned in Sunday school and we learned in church about kindness and love and generosity and compassion you know faith and how good jesus was and what was happening in my family which was <clears throat> um, physical and emotional abuse daily and yeah. um i never there was a Bible in a bookcase in uh, my home. I never saw it taken off that bookcase or opened or read, ever. Um, we didn't pray. Um, going, going to church was like a cultural thing. <laughs> you know, uh, this is back in the 50s and 60s, and people, um, you know, <laughs> I, I saying this with quotes, everybody was a Christian. You know, on Sunday, we had blue laws. Nothing was open. It was hard to get gasoline. Most of the gas stations were closed. It was, you know, all the grocery stores were closed, et cetera. Um, yeah. yeah. You no, know, it, it was a a kind of a different world where there was this pretense that everybody was a Christian. But in reality, um, they really weren't. It was just just what you did, you know. And so when I was like uh, 14, 15 years old, um, I started looking for other answers and my, uh, I had a big talk with my pastor and he was an extreme disappointment on um, what he told me we really believed. And so I was coming, I came to the conclusion at that time that church was an act. It was just a big act, but nobody um, really believed in anything. And I started looking for answers and other things started. I'd been reading philosophy on my own because, of course, we didn't have that in uh, school. But, uh, you know, I started off with like Plato and Aristotle. I mean, I, I was very bright and, you know, and read all that stuff. And that eventually, you know, took me up into the 20th century with people like uh, Camus yeah. and Jean Paul Sartre and. Uh, Martin Heidegger and stuff like that. I had gone, I'd gone through Immanuel Kant and Heigl and people like that and gotten up to the 20th century. And uh, I basically just became um, a follower of them, the existentialists and their atheists. You know, and, and that's what happens today. I, uh, sorry, I, I think today that's very common. And that's why this is a good opening for us because I think a lot of people can relate to what you just said. 
they're they're searching for answers and they're relying on humanism, secular humanism. Yes. Like you said, philosophy, uh, science, you know. So we have all these things and they're not fulfilling. They're not satisfying. And that's where your story leads up to. Eventually, you come face to face with Jesus Christ, which is just awesome. But, um, you know, and, and even coming back to your childhood, how you grew up in your house, I think a lot of people have that story as well. There's a great dichotomy. At home, we're dealing with this, but the church says this. So what's what's going on? Why am I suffering? Why am I dealing with this? Yes. A lot of people have these questions. Um, but, you know, the Bible does provide all the answers. And, you know, you'll find out as you get closer to the Holy Spirit that there is hope. Okay, there is hope. And we're not responsible for other people, but we can actually help others once we get saved. Right. And I um, you know, I, I love science, I love history, but all of that changes all the time. Right. Science changes all the time. So fact and versus truth. The facts change, the truth never changes. Ex exactly. Like, for example, um, one of the interesting things about science that I think is relevant to this conversation is is virtually all theoretical. Um, physicists say that we know 3% or we're, we're knowing something about 3% of the universe that we live in. 97% of the universe we live in is composed of dark matter and dark energy and they know nothing, zero, nada, nothing about 97% of the universe that we live in. The point is, is that there's a whole lot more to this world than we know. And when we accept the fact that we know so little, we have to find truth to live by yeah. in um, wisdom literature, okay? Oh, yeah. um, the the Bible being there's there's a lot of wisdom literature out there, but um, I think that the um, main source of real wisdom literature is the Bible, and most especially um, the New Testament, and most specifically uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yeah. Um, so I I put Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as the source of pure wisdom, and everything else is. Um, hopefully supporting that to some degree or another. Amen and amen. Yeah, and that's where Jesus spoke and he's quoted in that. So yeah. I like reading that part because the words of Jesus himself are actually in there. And you know, and, and you said, it's really good what you said because everything else is changing. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. It's unchanging, yeah. And that that's what I've learned to rely on more and more for any problem I'm having, any question I'm having, because we live in the world, but we're not of the world. So I'm just grateful that we have that, right? We have that Holy Spirit inside of us that Jesus left behind for us to whisper in our ear, to tell us which way to go, to lead us and guide us into the truth, not to the facts, into the truth, like yeah. you said. And that's very, yeah. very true. And I find that more and more necessary today. Um, you know, the, our world is lost. You know, and Joyce Meyer said something to um, agree with you that the more she finds out, the more she knows, the more she realizes that she doesn't know anything at all. And I agree with that because the more you read, you can read and study the Bible forever and still not, you know, get to the crux and to the full depth of knowing everything. We just can't right. until we get to heaven. So with that in mind, you did go to heaven. <laughs> and, you know, this is exciting for me because um, it's, it's always it always gives me hope. I love talking to people who have had this experience. Um, now, you died and you were dead for 30 minutes or so. You weren't sure exactly how long, but around 8 p.m. you said you had probably passed out. And at that point, the next thing you remember, you were in a different realm. And you were with these beings, these dark beings in the beginning. And what did those beings tell you? And, and what happened with those beings? Um, they took me on a very long journey. You know, the experience may, uh, by the clock, have been so many minutes it may have been like one second but the point the point is is that i went outside of this time this world into another world where there is um no limit on time whatsoever so when people ask me how long was my experience i said oh it's a lot longer than um graduate school which by the way was three years um and people always like 
what are you talking about? I said, um, never mind. You won't understand. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, when you, but anyway, I learned a whole lot more in my experience outside of this world than I learned in graduate school. Trust me. Um, anyways, so they took me on this long journey into abject darkness where they turned on me and tore me apart, literally. And one of the questions that I always get, which is like, did it hurt? And it's like, yeah, yeah, it hurt. It hurt a lot. Now um, you were an atheist up to just to be clear for the audience. So up to this point, you were not accept you hadn't accepted Jesus in your heart. So obviously when I didn't you believe died, in God. I well, mean, you, like, well, you didn't believe in God. So when you died, you saw them first. So this is an eye yeah, opener, wake up. Yeah, call. these were these were my these were my brothers and sisters in atheism. These were my kindred spirits. Wow. They were not people always tell me what were the demons like? And they weren't demons, they were people lost just like me and this is where they go you know like wow. if you reject god you get to go to the place where there's no god the problem with the place where there's no god is this there's no love there's no kindness there's no butterflies there's no sunshine there's no water um you know it's just pure torment now what did they tell you what were they saying to you because you heard them well, talking I fought them as best I could. Of course, there were lots of them. I don't know how many, hundreds and hundreds. And um, I'm lying there, and I heard a voice said, pray to God. And I don't know where the voice came from. I think it might have come from me. I don't know, from my childhood, you know. But anyways, so I um, began to pray feebly because um, I'd basically forgotten how to pray. And just thought praying was like reciting things that you'd memorize, because that's what we learned in Sunday school. We memorized, you know, Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm and stuff like that, and we recited them. So that's what I was trying to remember. And anyways, the people around me were horrified. I, It's not an exaggeration to say that my prayers were like throw, throwing boiling oil on them or something. Wow. Well, praise God. And, That's so encouraging. Yeah, it's really, really, this is important stuff because um, prayer is very, very powerful if you mean it. Yeah. And I, and I, I was praying out of desperation. Okay. What were you People saying? Said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want um, stuff like that. And what was happening to them? You said they were, well, they, they responded with, hmm. now I can't repeat what they said because they're, vulgarity their obscenity was far beyond anything i've ever heard in this world wow but what they were saying so i'm ed editing all that garbage out what they were saying was three things there is no god nobody can hear you and if you don't stop immediately we're going to do much worse things to you okay but so i'm going to pause there for a moment what those three things you just said <clears throat> you know what the enemy still says that to people today in this world yep. when people are discouraged and i'm talking about believers or unbelievers it doesn't matter at this point i'm talking about everyone if they are in a bad situation and, and i think unbelievers will hear it more the enemy will talk to them but the enemy does try to torment believers as well you know i've, ha yep. I've had my share of spiritual warfare and saying no in the name of jesus i rebuke that thought yeah but he comes he talks to me he says well you know what it's not going to work yeah you're wasting your time he, he won't have the courage to say certain things to me. Like he won't tell me, well, God's not hearing you and there's no God because I've, I've reached past that. But, and, and I'm sure obviously you have too, but he still tries to talk to people. And yeah, he says, says God doesn't care. God doesn't care. Yeah. You know what? You're it's not going to work. It didn't work before. What makes you think it's yeah. going to work now when you're battling a chronic problem, especially right. with like health? Right. This right. is something I face. So, you know, your story was really, really encouraging to me because they are the ones who are desperate. You know, Curry Blake said, when the enemy works overtime to try to make you scared, it's because he's scared. Yeah, exactly. Is that your experience? So, yeah. But the interesting thing was, as they're threatening me, um, they are retreating pretty rapidly away from me because they did not want to hear these from my point of view now, my pitiful attempt at prayer. Um, we can talk about prayer later, but prayer is a whole lot more than just reciting some memorized lines, okay? Um, you know, I mean, Jesus told me, and, and I'm quoting him, prayer, prayer is going to come from the heart. 
you know, it's not just like spewing words, okay? Th throwing flowery words, um, you know, isn't a bad thing, but real, real prayer is when you, you, when you cry out to God from the heart, because um, God judges by the heart, not by appearances. That's in the Bible. Um, so anyways, eventually they were gone. They so they were threatening taken... you, and as they were threatening you, they were walking away, and their voices were getting smaller and smaller. This is important to recant. R running oh away. God. Running oh, away. Oh, wow. Running. Okay, amen to that then. Yeah, the devil runs away from me. Amen. That's something I say every day. Yeah. <laughs> but this is important for, for people to understand on earth, and this is why yes. this episode is so important. The enemy yes. is scared of you, oh child of God. And as you pray and as you get close to God, he will try to tell you that, oh, it's not working. But the law, God has a law, God's law, just like the law of gravity. The law is he has to retract. He has to retreat. He must leave. If you are praying, if you are getting close to God, right? Submit to God, resist the enemy, and he will flee from you. And you have experienced this. Yes. <laughs> and I tell people, um, I, I've said this so many hundreds of times, but I'm not tired of saying it. You've got to pray from the heart. You've got to pray powerfully. And you have to use the name of Jesus. Um, I have talked to people and said, well, I say the rosary. And I said, the rosary is nice, good for you. That's not going to do the job. It's not going to get it done. <clears throat> you know, it's like taking a knife to a gunfight. That's what a pastor said this week. Uh, yeah, Why exactly. Take, a knife? Yeah. take the name yeah. of Jesus. Don't yeah. do that, right? You got to come with your full weapon. You can go to and take a knife if it's a knife fight. Yeah, this is not but, a knife fight. This is a sword, right? Well, for the for the devil and the demons, the name of Jesus is the atomic bomb. It's 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 the ultimate weapon. It's it's bigger than artillery shell. It's bigger than you know a howitzer. It's you know it. He cannot bear it. That's fantastic. It's got power. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, we know that, but it's so refreshing to hear that because you've seen it in the spirit realm. So, what yeah. did Jesus tell you? Now, you after this, you did reach Jesus's doorstep or how did it work what happened oh, um my conversation with jesus went on for a very very long time but the um the bottom line was he was trying to convince me that um i was not ready to go to heaven and that i had to come back to this world and live the life that he had created that god had created for me when i was born and how old were you at this time when this experience happened? 38. Okay, so you were 38, and then he sent you back, all right? And then what? what, yeah, what but, he, but I didn't want to come back, and so he he's trying to convince me to come back. So we had a long conversation with me trying to argue to go to heaven and him convincing me that that just wasn't happening right now. And the bottom line was um, the, the final argument where I he defeated me um, was – well, what do you want me to do if I go back? And he said, love the person that you're with. And I said to him, okay, I got it. But um, what I want to do is I want to build a shrine to you. And I started to describe, describe the shrine. Like I, I mean, I went into great detail about how I was going to go out into the country and find a, you know, a big piece of farm and um, just devote my life to being, building a shrine to Jesus. And he said, please don't do that. He begged me not to do it. And I said, why not? And he said, uh, I don't need it. God doesn't need it. Um, and I said, what about all the cathedrals and the shrines and all the holy places? You know, like he said, those are for people. We don't need that. We don't we want to live in your life. We don't need we don't need those those buildings and those ones. I love, by the way, I love cathedrals, you know, I love shrines. And I go to them, but um, they're for us, you know. Right. Uh, the way that we glorify God is how we live our life. And he said, you know, "Love." I find that interesting because love actually was the greatest commandment of Jesus. He said, "The entire you know, law of Moses can be summarized in one law, right? Love your uh, love your neighbor as you love yourself, and of course, yeah. you love yourself too." And um, so, love is really reflective of the whole New yeah. Testament, the the gospel. So, yeah. yeah. So he told me, love the person you're with. And I said, what good will that do? And he said, if you love the person that you're with, they will carry that love and take it to the next person. Right. And I said, 
Well, that's a nice theory, but like um, something bad could happen to them and then they won't um, have that love anymore. And he said, um, yeah, that's possible. But he said, there's millions of people involved in this. It's um, God's plan. And I said, well, there's billions of people on the earth and you've got millions of people trying to be loving. Um, it's not going to work. The, the, the bad people are going to win. And he said, yeah, but the millions of people in this world are not alone because we have billions of angels. And I said, well, okay, you got millions of people, you got billions of angels, but I don't know if it's going to work. And he said, and he said, here was the kicker. It's God's plan. So that will prevail. Wow. And I couldn't think of anything smart <laughs> to uh, object to that. I mean, like, what can you say? When, when Jesus tell you, tells you it's God's plan, it's like, okay, um, so I have to, so I got to go with the plan, even though there's days when I feel a little hopeless, when I feel discouraged, when I feel like, you know, this doesn't seem to be working out too well. Yeah. You know, I know that um, I got to stay, stand firm in the faith in God's plan and not let the fiery darts of the evil one, you know, get to me. I got to put up my shield of faith, you know? Yeah. Wow, that that's so powerful. And, you know, this, this changed your life radically. So up to this point, again, just to, to clarify, you were an atheist, and then you came back, you obviously came back in your body, you're alive, it's about 30 years later or more, and here you are, and you're telling your story, and you said after that, you had become a pastor, started pastoring in a church, and your whole life changed, your family life changed, some people didn't believe you, I think you had to quit your job, different things had happened, so what was it like coming back to earth, having gone through that experience of meeting Jesus and seeing, uh, you know, that your tormentors, and now back in the world. Yeah. I didn't want to be here because, uh, frankly, um, for the um, first uh, couple of months, nobody believed me, told me I was crazy, me, told me to forget it, told me that I'm an see a psychiatrist, told me to um, get on with my life and stuff like that. It was very, very discouraging. And of course, I'm reading the Bible like crazy and memorizing verses. And so I went into a phase, which I'm not proud of, of thunder preaching at everybody I met. Um, I would, in a very loud voice, quote scripture to them and threaten them <laughs> with hell and damnation. Right. Uh, I would strongly urge you you not meaning you personally, I mean anyone, not to do that. It was counterproductive. I turned so many people off with that approach. Um, and I turned uh, off a lot of people permanently, like forever. They don't want anything to do with me because that's what they remember. And um, finally, I realized that I was not having any positive um, reaction from anyone and that I needed to um, rethink my strategy. The good thing was um, I recovered from my illness over a period of months and was able to go to church. And I found a whole different way of evangelizing, which was like kindness, patience, listening, you know, building relationships, you know, um, behaving like a loving person and loving people as opposed to um, shouting at them and um, trying to beat them into submission, you know, <laughs> does I've, my experience, you know, doesn't work. doesn't work. Matter of fact, it does the opposite. It drives them away. Right. So you, you had, to, I guess, yeah, you had a long journey ahead, but you were now with the Lord. Um, you got saved. You knew the word. You were started to read the Bible. And, you know, one of the things that people often ask, um, and I'm sure the viewers are wanting to know as well, which I want to cover, what was it like being in Jesus's presence? What did you see his face or his persona? Or, I mean, how was it? Because many people can't seem to grasp this in the physical realm. Um, of course, I, I think about that a lot. I mean, this was in 1985, and I think about that presence every day um first of all i want to say it's beyond words but since we're talking i'm going to try and use some words to describe it first of all the love that he 
expressed to me that I felt from him was beyond any um, love that we've experienced this world. Like, let me just try and describe it this way. If you took all the love that you've had in your life from all the loving people, your mom, your dad, your, your family, your spouse, you know, your children, whatever, take all that love and um, compact it into one love. It still wasn't, it still isn't as great as his love. Oh, it's just absolutely overwhelming. I mean, my response to him was love was to um, cry of joy like I've never cried before. And matter of fact, uh, a problem that I have is sometimes when I feel that love publicly, like in church or when I've been preaching and stuff like that, I start crying. And people don't understand why. Like, why is the pastor falling apart in front of our eyes? You know, and it's like, yeah, because... I'm feeling that love. Yeah, and crying doesn't yep. need to fall apart, you know, because I know what you mean. Sometimes his love is so overwhelming that it just brings us, it could be tears of joy or just tears of release, right? Yeah. And the, the other thing that I want people to know was that, um, and this is really important, that he liked me, he likes us. You know, I felt deep down inside a lot of shame and guilt, a lot. And I was like worried that he was going to disapprove of me, that that his his love would be very conditional. You know, it's like, you know, I love you, but you've been a rotten person. <laughs> you know, like you deserve a good beating. Thank you very much. Um, whatever. Um, no, he likes us. He does not approve of the bad things we've done. And he made that really clear to me. But the reason why he doesn't approve of it is because we've rejected all the good gifts. And of course, the first gift is the gift of love, but it's also the gift of hope. It's the gift of faith. You know, it's the gift of all the uh, fruits of the Holy Spirit. We've rejected all those gifts. And it's like, it's so disappointing. His, his, his disapproval is that we aren't being the children of God, the people of God that he created us to be in the first place. So it's like, you know, let me, let me give you an analogy. You have a kid and this kid has lots of promise. They're bright, they're, they're creative, they're, you know, um, good at school and everything like that. And they turn out to be um, a drug addict or an alcoholic or whatever. Yeah. You know, it breaks your heart. That's what Jesus would, I would, yeah. the thing that I learned I was breaking his heart because he loves me so much and I had been such a disappointment. Yeah. I'm yeah. so sorry. But but the good news is is that I can relate to people that are doing it. So if I could get one thing across to the community, stop stabbing Jesus in the heart and let his love come into your life. I have one more question, though. Was somebody praying for you that before you had this experience, did you have a relative somewhere? <laughs> um, after my experience, I only knew one religious person in the whole world was a nun whom I'd had in uh, a class uh, many years earlier, actually 13 years earlier. So I called her up. Um, this was my, uh, a couple months after the experience, and she came over, and um, I told her what had happened to me. And... You know, being the perfect little nun, she sat there, you know, just quietly and listened to me. And um, she said, I have one question. And I said, what's that? And she said, um, why did it take so long? And I said, I don't understand your question. She said, I've been praying for you for 13 years every day. And I have the whole convent praying for you every day for 13 years. And I want to know why it took 13 years to get this to happen. You know what? I'm, I'm going to close with that powerful note because I personally know so many people who are praying for their children, their nieces, their nephews, their parents. And guess what? It works.